Hello everybody. Um, just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right, I think it's working. So, hello everyone. My name is Shai Roskapadia. I have been working as a physical therapist in U.S. since 2016. Prior to that, I graduated with bachelor's in physical therapy from MGM Medical College in Lore in 2013, where Dr. Hari Babu, sir, everybody knows that, used to teach before he moved to PPSU to become Commander-in-Chief of Physio Department, that is your principal. He's a great teacher, I cannot deny that. I hope everyone is staying safe and doing well with everything going on. Life has changed drastically due to COVID-19 pandemic and I know this change is not easy. However, let me start with my own example. I work in a skilled nursing facility where we get mostly 60 years and about patients. If you are following US news, maximum number of deaths have happened in skilled nursing facility. I have treated COVID patients and it's okay to be scared, but don't let it overwhelm you. My 80% patients are COVID positive now and three of my co-workers are positive as well. But others are still COVID negative and still working. In short, what I'm trying to say here is that treat your patients, but don't let your God down. All right, so as healthcare workers, it's our responsibility to know the facts about the disease and to know what's our role in this situation. To begin with, just to throw some light on COVID-19 background. Coronaviruses have been around for centuries. I personally have treated patients infected by coronaviruses in the past. What we are dealing with right now is the new coronavirus that is SARS-CoV-2. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome which is highly contagious and is responsible for COVID-19, that is coronavirus disease of 2019. So far, 213 countries have been affected by COVID-19 and India is one of them. As we all know, there is no certain treatment of COVID-19 yet. That's why we are focusing on preventative measures like lockdown, quarantine, stay at home to reduce the spread of COVID. We know already now that it spreads through respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or speaks. Also by touching contaminated surface and then touching eyes, mouth, or nose. That's why right now it is said that keep your hands away from your face. Remember, keep your hands away from your face 
whenever you go out for shopping or if you touch any contaminated surface. I'm not gonna go in detail of the precautions as we all are aware of that. Going to the next slide. So what is considered as exposure to COVID-19 patient? This is very important for us. So first, living in same household as a sick person with COVID-19. So if you're under the same roof with COVID-19 person, you are exposed to that. Second, caring for a person with COVID-19 without proper PPE. Here, the thing is to remember is without proper PPE, if you are caring for a person, you are exposed. Third, being within six feet of an infected person for more than a few minutes, more than 10 to 15 minutes were considered as you were exposed. And being in direct contact with secretions from an infected person. So these are the points to be considered when, you're tr when you are um, with the person with the COVID-19 and this is considered as you were exposed. So again, with my example, I treated a patient without proper PPE, not knowing that the person is infected as the patient did not have any symptoms at that time. Later on, I and other therapists who treated that patient were asked to self-quarantine and to get tested if we show any symptoms. That, pa that patient was already in the building. We have been treating the patient for a month or so and who knew that the patient would get something from outside and yes he was found positive later so this can happen with you as well so be very careful whenever you are treating the patients now because you don't know who will be covid positive in this situation there are important uh, these are important to know so that we don't panic or get scared while covid treating the COVID patients, or if somebody asks you to treat them. So don't be scared. If you know these things, you, can, you would be able to take care of yourself. All right. So incubation period. Incubation period is equal to the time from the exposure to first symptoms. Typically, it, it's 2 to 14 days. In case of COVID-19, it is considered the median is considered as four days. So people, even without symptoms, can be contagious during this period. So you, we need to be really careful, even if the patients are not showing the symptoms, you never know if they are affected or not. Symptoms, we all are aware of that. I'm just gonna quickly go through that. So symptoms are fever, cough, dyspnea, chest pressure, loss of sense of taste and smell, body ache, altered mental status, which especially is seen in elderly people. And now they are saying another added symptom um, in the list is COVID toes, which is turning off the toes in purple color and getting sore there. Vast majority of cases have mild symptoms. Some cases can turn into viral pneumonia. So after knowing this about the symptoms, spread, exposure, now let's look into the CDC guidelines for the healthcare workers. It's very important. If you are going to work in the field, you should know that. So as a physiotherapist, if you're working in the field, you have to first pre-screen that is temperature check and check your symptoms daily. Self-monitor for fever and symptoms. Wear mask, face mask for 14 days after exposure to protect others. So in this case, let me add another thing is like, they're asking for double masking. Double masking means that you are wearing a mask and the patient is wearing masks. It's not like you are wearing two masks, okay? So double masking is really important if you're treating a patient and you feel like you have been exposed 
and uh, you want and you don't know even if the patient was exposed. So double masking is really important. Maintaining social distancing as we all are doing right now. Disinfect and clean workspaces. Stop working if symptoms develop. Even if the symptoms are mild and consistent with COVID, you have to stop working. But as the revised guidelines, again, if your facility wants you, if they want you to you know, wear the complete PPE and treat the patients. You have to stick to the guidelines of your facility and the the state or, uh, you know, the country where you're working. Okay. To know about the proper P weight of PPE donning and doffing is really crucial here. So if you don't know, memorize it remember it anyhow you will need to know that i'm not gonna go in detail of that but every should everyone should know the proper way of it people now know know that they have to wear masks in public but if it's not handled properly you are just inviting the virus so always remember do not touch the front of the mask. Again, I'm repeating. Whenever you are putting the mask on or taking it off, do not touch the front of the mask. It's really important so that you don't get infected. Okay. So, are we essential or non-essential healthcare workers? Uh, I'm not sure about India what the situation is, but in US, uh, it's really important. Um, some people are considered essential right now and some people are not. So le let's see if we are important, uh, we are essential healthcare worker or not yet right now. Well, it depends. Our primary goal is to reduce the spread of infection. To preserve limited stock of PPE, which is really important to save are nurses aides that take care of the patients so if your facility your hospital has enough ppe stock do not hesitate to treat the patients they need you they really need you right now moreover home therapy inpatient therapy outpatient ther teletherapy i'm not talking about outpatient on site but outpatient teletherapy is something new right now that you can do the therapy um just like what i'm doing right now um are clearly considered essential for three reasons so physical therapy can reduce risk of hospitalization by keeping patients safe at home we can stre strengthen them reduce the risk of falls while working on their balance. Keeping an eye on their diet and hygiene is really important. Just imagine your patient is old, the patient is alone at home, nobody's taking care of uh, him in this situation because everything is in lockdown. And if you are essential, and if you can go in uh, to their place and take care of them, it's, it's gonna be really helpful to prevent the hospitalization of that person. Physical therapy can reduce emergency department burden by managing acute musculoskeletal conditions, for example, pain or spasms. So if the patient has been complaining of new pain, some, for example, a back pain or knee pain, and if you can treat the patient and um, you know help to relieve the pain, the patient would not go to the emergency department. So that would be really good in this situation because emergency department are already flooded by the COVID patients. Third, physical therapy is important for patients recovering from prolonged hospital stay or ICU survivors as they have tendency to develop PICS that is post-intensive care syndrome that we are going to discuss later. But yes, after discharging from hospital, it's very important that they get their therapy. Guys, if you have any questions, please type in the comment box. So I'll try to answer it after we are done with this presentation.
So please don't hesitate to type them there. Alrighty. So now let's come to the assessment assessment part, which is really important um, when we start a care with the patient to make a plan of care, right? So along with other routine assessment or evaluation, we have to consider extra steps, okay? So before entering the patient's room, know what precautions they are on. Or if the pa um, patient right now cannot come to the outpatient setting, right? So you are treating the patient and the patient is admitted in the hospital or let's say in nursing home, okay? So what precautions they are on, you should know that. Could be isolation precaution, that means airborne contact or droplet universal precaution or is you know, on room quarantine. So what's the difference between isolation and quarantine? Isolation is considered for the patients who are COVID positive in this case, okay? And quarantine means that they are the suspect of COVID-19. They are not diagnosed with COVID-19 yet. Considering that with COVID-19, many guidelines are recommending droplet and contact precautions, and in some cases, airborne precautions to be taken combinedly. They are still doing the research on it, but every state, every country has their own precautions going on right now. From the airborne precautions, what we are taking is N95 mask. Um, other than that, everything, everybody knows that how, what we have to wear uh, in PPEs. Second, we should know the supplemental oxygen parameters and check with the nurse if we are allowed to titrate or wean the patient off oxygen because that's the ultimate goal, right? That's our goal to wean off the patient from the oxygen so that patient can live their own life right? normally. Check if doctor has recommended incentives parameter or CPEP or nebulizer so that you can work accordingly. We know that, right? We have to time our therapy um, according to their nebulizer treatment or their CPEP treatment. And we have to train the patient for um, how to use the incentive spirometer. Look for any diet or fluid restrictions, medication effects or their side effects. Most important, don't forget to monitor vital signs. It's really, really, really important. You have to monitor their vitals before, during, and after treatment. As now, things have been changed because of limited availability of resources. It's important to know the code status of patient. Whether it's DNR, that means do not resuscitate, or full code, and act accordingly. So... Um, I think in India, we don't have that, I, um, in India, we don't have that, you know, we don't see the code status regularly. So, uh, in this case, we have to check if really they want the physical therapy or not. If they are DNR and they are towards the end of their life. You know, we are just, we just don't want to waste our, you know, treatment for them. We can treat the other patients. So it's just, we need to be just mindful when we are picking the patient up on therapy. So always know their DNR, DNR status or their full code. All right. What's next is, okay, what's next is, All right, this, uh, that's what we do with cardiopulmonary patients, right? Look, listen, and feel, right? That's what we have been learning in our cardio classes. Look, look for what? Look for breathing patterns, diaphragmatic breathing, edema, weight gain, or jugular vein distension. So you have to look for these things. And along with that, 
Swollen legs after therapy could be the sign of activity intolerance. So you have to look if the patient's legs were swollen after therapy. Listen. Listen for breath sounds, crackles or rails to lungs before and after treatment or communicate with the nurse. If you don't feel comfortable, if you feel like you cannot, um, you know, you're not good at listening to the sounds, just ask the nurse because they do it every day. Feel. Feel for increase in peripheral edema two to three hours after the treatment, which is again the sign of activity intolerance if present. I'm not saying that peripheral edema would be just a sign of activity intolerance, but it could be in addition to something else. Again, monitor for respiratory capacity, heart rate, blood pressure, shortness of breath, peripheral edema, before, during, and after your therapy session. So it's very crucial right now to monitor them because they are hemodynamically uh, unstable. Okay, so the evaluation is done. Now we have to go to our goals and treatment. As various studies and clinical trials are going on, there is no established protocol for physiotherapy treatment of COVID. It's all case by case basis, your clinical judgment and interdisciplinary approach. In general, our goal is to improve respiratory capacity, stabilize their vitals, increase cardiopulmonary function, improve safety, improve independence, and functional capacity. Last but not the least, improve patient's understanding of disease progress and risk. Here, not only we are going to educate the patient, but their family as well. Because we have to stop the spread and we have to tell them how the disease is going to affect their normal lives. Okay. So, Treatment. Treatment will vary depending on the severity of disease, whether it is mild, moderate, or severe. Patient's medical stability and tolerance level matters here too. So it, depending on their medical stability and tolerance, you will decide what kind of therapy they would need right now. Remember, it's SOS. Even they are, the doctors are giving the medications depending on their symptoms. So you need to be very mindful um, and attentive when you're doing any kind of therapy with them. For mild and moderate cases, if permissible by doctor, treatment will consist of functional exercises and balance exercises, for example, such as, you know, sit to stand, mini squats, step up and downs, Avoid use of weights initially, you know, right? So when you uh, do heavy resisted exercises, it just increases the burden of, um, you know, burden on the car, um, on heart and lungs. So just avoid and try to minimize the use of weights. Um, try to do a little bit of active uh, or active exercises right now. Safety strategies will include education, fall recovery strategy, use of DMEs. That means durable medical equipments as rolling walker or cane if necessary to reduce fall risks. So primarily this COVID is hitting the patients who are in the age group of 60 or above. Typically, I'm not saying that this is the only age group which is getting affected. But in this case, because of, you know, new weakness or vertigo or, uh, you know, dizziness, what they are feeling right now, uh, there are chances that they can fall. So to prevent that, what we can do is just tell them temporarily to use the rolling walker, just train them to use rolling walker or cane if that can be helpful to reduce the risk of falls. Then cardiopulmonary endurance. Again, don't just tell the patients to run on the treadmill. Be mindful, 
that be mindful and know the limitations of your patients. Because of prolonged hospitalization and the disease itself will lead to muscle weakness and decrease activity tolerance, which can reduce functional mobility. So functional mobility that is standing, transferring from bed to chair, toilet transfer, regular walking like short walks or a little bit of longer walks if they can tolerate, etc. should be taken in consideration. Energy conservation techniques should be educated to the patients. That is taking breaks frequently, avoid rushing, sit down to bathe, etc. That's what we do with the cardiopulmonary patients, right? Because of shortness of breath, they won't be able to do the things in one stretch. So we have to treat, teach them the energy conservation techniques. There are different kind of energy conservation techniques that you can you know, learn on your own as well. Along with these treatment strategies, we have to consider patients' psychosocial needs, especially when they haven't seen their family, you know, and they have been seeing and watching people around only in PPE. They cannot even see their faces. It is scary, isn't it? Right? So assure patient, educate them, and show little empathy. They are scared. So um, be you know, be a little gentle with them when you're treating them. Don't force them to do the things because they are not in the condition to participate in strenuous activities right now. Breathing exercises. It's really important. Along with personal breathing and diaphragmatic breathing, we can use different variations like equal ratio breathing, inhale time, in which the inhale time is equal to exhale time. Second would be prolonged inhale, in which um, the inhales are going to be longer than, sh uh, than the exhales. In this case, patients should be strong enough to perform this. Try on your own. See if you can do that. So inhale for six counts and exhale for three counts. It is strenuous, isn't it? Okay, moving to the prolonged exhale. Inhale for three counts and exhale for eight counts. Helps to calm down the patient and helps in shortness of breath. So um, equal ratio breathing right now and prolonged exhale. And then when patient feels a little stronger, we can just proceed to um, prolonged inhale. Patients should be educated and use of incentive spirometer, as I t said earlier as well. Um, the next is going to be respiratory muscle manual resistive exercises. And we can use any technique or therabands to perform these exercises. Try to teach patients self-assistive exercises to limit your exposure with these patients. Because don't forget other patients who are not COVID positive needs you too, right? So if the, there are plenty of patients other than COVID patients like stroke patients or, you know, fracture patients, they need you. So be careful and try to teach them the exercises or try to teach the other staff like nurses or the aides or the family members if they can perform some exercises with them, okay? Next is chest physiotherapy, which includes chest percussions and post postural drainage to remove mucus secretions and aid in breathing. I'm not gonna go in detail because it's a major or vast topic in itself. So chest physiotherapy is another part of the treatment. Airway clearance technique. As in most cases, mucus is less common, right? The major symptom, the main, the most common symptom is dry cough. It's not, it doesn't come with the expectoration. So um, as the 
chances are less in this case of mucus generation. So we need to be very mindful while um, choosing this technique. Again, ACT is not recommended unless COVID patient is present. COVID is present in the patients with other diseases like cystic fibrosis, emphysema, COPD, or asthma. In ARDS, it is relatively contraindicated because of severe pulmonary edema. In some places, vibration or rotation beds are used to provide chest PT. So even you don't have to get yourself exposed to that. The beds will do your job. Other devices like a capella or therapep can also be used as ACT devices. But again, extra precautions need to be taken as these procedures are aerosol generating and can increase the risk of spread. Okay, so vast majority does not need ACT. It's relatively contraindicated. Just ask your doctor, ask the patient's doctor before, um, before implementing ACT techniques. In ICU, if permissible, patients should be encouraged to get out of bed and participate in active exercises. So here in the slide, it's written 100 leg lifts. This is the expectation. But if the patient is not in condition of doing that, just a little bit of things can be really helpful. Just few leg lifts, few arm lifts, little bit of movement, um, just getting in and out of the bed, sitting on the chair would be really helpful. Okay, so I found a wonderful video online which is going to be very helpful. This is regarding the positioning of COVID patients. And that's what we have to teach the patient. So I'm just going to turn it on. Okay. All right, I think YouTube page, YouTube page. Mizaga Turant. YouTube page, Alan. Okay, my YouTube link to the video. Shai? Shai? Okay. Yeah, skip the video. I'll send you over the link. Skip the video. I'm not sure if the audio is, um, if you can hear the audio. If you can give me a thumbs up or say something. I'm just going to move on and play this video later. I think the audio is the problem. All right. <clears throat> so. Now moving to the next slide. Reassessment is really important here as these patients might be medically unstable. So, stop treatment when the patient complains of chest pain, 
complains of severe shortness of breath. If the blood pressure drops more than 20 mmHg. If the pulse is increased more than 140. If blood pressure uh, moves or raises to more than 200 by 110. Oxygen saturation drops down more than 88 percentage or the respiratory rate is 20 uh, higher than 28 or lower than 10 per minute. Additional precaution that we need to consider is monitor for the symptoms during the entire treatment session. Don't lay down the patient right after the treatment increase because we need to increase their endurance, right? So encourage them if they can sit upright in the chair or just stand or just take a little walk um, every now and then. So be um, careful. Don't just tell them, okay, your treatment is done. You can just lay down in bed. Don't do that. Monitor for worsening edema two to three hours after the function treatment that we have seen before as well. So how would we know that the patients are getting benefited by physiotherapy, right? There should be some measure. So we have to use our usual test measures um, like we usually do in different cases. Let's see, balance and fall risk. For that, we use Berg balance, tinnity, or tuck, right? For strengthening. Here, we are not talking about the lower extremity strength or upper body strengthening. Here, we, of course, they, uh, these muscles are going to be weak. We know that. But here, we are focusing major on the respiratory muscles. So as diaphragm and intercostals are unable to provide adequate ventilation, it will lead to recruitment of accessory muscles, which are sternocleidomastoids and scalene, right? So use of these muscles at rest will indicate respiratory distress. And if the patient is not using these muscles, we'll know that, okay, the, uh, their, their inspiratory and expiratory muscles are getting, you know, better. And that's how you would know that their breathing is getting better. So respiratory capacity. Again, if you have been teaching them the deep breathing techniques and you have been retraining their respiratory muscles, you will know, you'll get the idea if they are able to do it um, better now than before. Activity tolerance. How would we check the activity tolerance? We all know about the Borg scale of perceived exertion, right? We usually implement with the cardiopulmonary patients. So in this case too, we have to implement this. Physical performance test, two or six minute walk test, again, check if the patient is able to tolerate all these tests, all right? Pain, so here the patient usually complains of chest pain, body ache, sometimes headache too. So we need to um, test them on the scale of VAS scale or faces, pain AD or Wong Baker. We all know this pain scale, right? Um, then comes the gait quality. So we have to use dynamic gait index, gait speed. Additional impairments could be, you know, skin integrity because they have been laying in the bed for so long if they were in ICU. They, in ICU, people, um, nurses are focusing on position change, frequent position change, but still, you never know. So there might be the chances of, um, you know, bed sores, and the other things so just be mindful about that you have to check the sensations and the vis visual spatial th disorders too all right so we will be seeing increased cases of pics nowadays you know why right secondary to covid um people are more are admitted in the icu for a long time patients will have cognitive emotional, physical symptoms, which needs to be considered as well while you're treating these patients. So what comes in the cognitive symptoms? Decreased memory, thinking problems, difficulty talking, they might be forgetful, 
poor concentration, trouble organizing, and problem solving. Emotional symptoms will be nightmares, unwanted memories, anxiety, depression, decreased motivation. Physical symptoms will be muscle weakness, fatigue, decreased mobility, difficulty breathing, and insomnia. So we need to, t we need to know the symptoms and act accordingly. Patients who are on mechanical ventilation would be considered for therapy only when permitted by doctor. Patients should be alert, minimally able to participate in therapy. They should be hemodynamically stable and should have respiratory stability. So you have to see all these points if you are treating the patient who are on mechanical ventilation. Here, doing the passive movements is not gonna make any difference. You are exposing yourself, you're increasing the chances of spreading the infection. So just try to minimize your thinking that, okay, that patient will be benefited by passive range of motion. No, not right now. So to reduce our exposure in certain cases, ICU nurses can be educated and exercising the patients as well so that you don't have to go in and out of the ICU. You know, um, we have to save PPE. We have to save ourselves and we have to reduce the spread of this disease. So train the ICU nurses. They are really helpful in these cases. Finally, what is the leading cause of COVID-19 mortality? It is ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. So what's our role in this? You have been hearing a lot about proning lately, right? In the patient on ventilator, in this, what we do is patient is positioned in prone, with the help of designated team, and the pa patient is positioned in this prone position for 12 to 18 hours, it helps in improving the oxygenation in the dependent part of the lungs. It can also be done in the non-ventilated patients. I was trying to show you in the video. Um, let's, let's see if I can just bring it back up again. So in this case, the patients are, are sedated and they are especially prone teams made um, for this turning manure. Some of you are practicing as outpatient physiotherapist or in regular wards. If you are not experienced in doing proning, don't try to learn it right now as it can cause harm more than any good for you or the team. For students, it's something to learn for future. All right, so there's more to say, but you know, because of the time limitation and let me check if I have any questions to answer. Uh, let me go through that. So if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm gonna try to um, get the video as well. I'll send the link. I'll send the link. Let me look at the questions.
because of some technical difficulties i'm not able to show uh, the video i would later send the link or um just write down the link here so you can check that video that i wasn't able to pull it up all right so time for the questionings Does PD positioning work in patient who is suffering from COVID-19? Yeah, so as I said, that there are certain positions that you have to teach the patients that can be done on their own. Uh, yes, it works. But again, you have to check with the doctor if it's allowed or not because they know the condition more than us. So that was a good question. Deepak Singh, along with PPE, is negative pressure room helpful? So the researchers are still working on it to know if that's helpful. But in most cases, they don't recommend the negative pressure room right now. Only the PPEs are helpful. Let me check the other questions. So CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure therapy. That's usually used when the patient um, has obstructive sleep apnea. It's a machine that the patient put the mask on or the nose piece and it delivers a constant or steady pressure. So that is CPAP machine. Okay, you can just go into your books and find the detail on that. Kriti Desai asked, which exercises were beneficial for, uh, okay, will be beneficial for COVID patients? As I said, um, all the ac active exercises that we can do with the patient or the self-assisted exercises that they can do on their own, without getting tired and we need to be very mindful about keeping um, the symptoms and their vitals in mind right so i showed this slide before that if you see this some the if you see the symptoms just stop the treatment right there And these are the exercises or the things that we can do with patients. All right. Okay, if COVID patients are on ventilator, then on which mode they will be? It's again, it's we are not handling the ventilator in this condition. In US, there are respiratory therapists other than physiotherapists. So in India, I know we don't have a, another or separate designation as respiratory therapists, but here the respiratory therapists are trained for ventilator, um, ventilator handling. So I wouldn't, uh, I would rather tell you that don't go there right now to learn about the ventilators and it depends the mode depends on the doctor and patient conditions what is energy conservation technique and how can it help Pratik asked, okay, so energy conservation techniques, just with the word, it explains itself that in this condition, for example, with the cardiopulmonary patients, they don't have enough energy, there's no endurance, they are weak, they have shortness of breath, so imagine just telling the patient to walk 
100 feet or more than that just in one go they won't be able to do that but they have to make it to the next end of the room or the hallway so how we are gonna teach them to make it to the next point so in this case we tell we teach them the energy conservation technique we will tell them to take breaks in between so that they can make to the end point the next thing is suppose the patient is wants to take a shower right so some people like to take standing showers and they have been doing all their life but in this case we have to tell them that install a shower seat sit while taking the shower so that you don't get tired there are plenty of uh, energy conservation techniques you can just check in the books but this is what the gist is please share your experience in treating covid patient hurry bugs are asked okay so honestly honestly it's really scary it is really scary when we um when we got the patients in us we just heard that okay it hit seattle before the first at the first place and the first place to hit was the skilled nursing facility um plenty of people were affected many people died so we already knew that it is going to be really um problematic for our place as well as i said earlier our place has people live there so where i work there is independent living assisted living and skill nursing so in independent living um people with the age more than 60 year they live like they they have their apartments there the assisted living is the same they live there they have their apartments but the nurses are there to take care of them and the skill nursing where i usually treat the patients is the place where the patients come from the hospital after uh, they get discharged and they are not ready to go home so this is like a step down for them so what was happening is we had the patients they came from hospital they were here and every day we were getting new uh, guidelines that whether we should treat the patients whether what should we do do we discharge the patient to the home they are not ready what should we do so we have to we were working according to cdc guidelines and we were working according to our state guidelines and along with that what our facility needs okay so as i said i treated a patient the patient was there for more than a month the patient was there for um i think it was for the stroke not for covid but ultimately the patient was getting worse didn't have the covid symptoms but wasn't able to um do the exercises that he used to do before he wasn't able to walk so we uh, we just recommended the nurse to get him tested that something is off so suddenly you know the patient wasn't feeling well he was sent to the hospital later on we found out that the patient was covid positive and that was a shocking news for us because we didn't know that we had the covid patient in our building and that was the day where everybody was got scared and um we started taking extra precautions treating those patients um uh, plenty of patients right now are covid on our unit and the typical symptoms because they are old age people they are on the supplemental oxygen and believe me their supplemental oxygen they are on 5 to 6 liters of oxygen right now 5 to 6 liters and honestly some family members just want to change the code status from full code to dnr because they don't want to see the patient suffering or their family members suffering some people are recovering as well 
it's not like everybody's dying but some people are recovering too uh they are showing the symptoms of delirium and they are very deconditioned so and very weak so we need we are taking extra care of them right now Okay, I think we are done. Oh no, we have more patients here. Oh, sorry, more questions here. What breathing exercises to do regularly to increase respiratory capacity of non-COVID person? Good question. So, uh, all the deep breathing exercises And, you know, it's it's really a normal thing for a phys physiotherapist to know about the breathing exercises. There are plenty of breathing exercises. Um, there are resisted breathing exercises as well. Uh, focused, uh, local, um, focal breathing exercises that you can uh, check in your books. But yes, there's no harm in doing the right breathing exercises. And especially, I would suggest yoga. Yoga is pretty good um, to increase the lung capacity. So if you can, you should uh, encourage people to perform yoga exercises. I'm not saying that it is going to help in the COVID patients right now. But yes, in, uh, in general too, yoga has pretty good um you know asanas for increasing the lung capacity yes i definitely recommend breathing exercises for a general population yes of course because right now what's the situation is if you are healthy and you have good lung capacity the chances of you getting sick you will catch the covid but the chances of you getting worse will be less if you have healthy lung function okay can you please tell me the mental status of covid19 patients who are positive and people who are on quarantine Okay, so first of all, because whatever chaos is going on here in the world, they are scared. Everybody is scared. Even when my coworkers found that they were positive, even they are young, they were scared. Um, so, of course, they are getting panicked. And just imagine, you will be inside a room, right? Even if you have a big house, you are not supposed to be with other family members so how are you gonna feel right so you are not gonna feel good you will be scared that what's going on i had the normal life i used to if you have a kid i used to be sit with my kid i used to sit with my family i used to go out but now everything has changed so definitely it affects their mental status and as i said earlier it hits hard in elder population. They have depressed. They get depression, anxiety, depression, other emotional status, as we saw in the pics, right? So, and they're especially there's. They have the brain fog. They cannot react to the things very uh, quickly now. They have um, memory issues. They cannot recollect the things. So, yes, it does affect their mental status. 
So I have got good results of pranayam, like Brahmi pranayam, in my known COVID patients. Okay, if you got it, it's again, I'm saying the researchers are still doing the research. And as long as you are taking all the points that we discussed earlier in consideration, you can do that. If you are confident enough, if you're, you consulted the doctor, so there's nothing wrong in doing any yogas. But again, consult with the doctor before you do anything with the patients. Okay. What is the role of exercise in improving immunity? Sir, hurry, Baba, sir, you're asking me. I mean, you're the best person to explain that. So I would rather um, ask you to explain that it's again it does not affect it directly i mean it's not directly proportional but uh of course a healthy body and healthy mind of uh, is is always good i'll get back to this point again Okay. How can how we can stable respiratory and shortness of breath? So as I say that personally breathing. Of course, right now the patients are uh, very anxious, so you have to calm them down. And for shortness of breath, we usually use the personally breathing technique. Um, and uh, ex activity, sorry, exercise, exercises like I discussed earlier, which was, let me pull the slide again, okay, equal ratio breathing and prolonged exhale. So I think these are really beneficial that what I have tried with the patients here, it really helped. So, sorry, I'm just going through the uh, the comments that everyone has put. So I'm just browsing through the questions if I missed any.
does CDC guideline and WHO have same protocol or is there any other better guideline because I'm following WHO okay so they just work side by side it's not the WHO is not gonna say anything different from CDC guidelines CDC is basically for communicable diseases right and in this case they WHO is follows following what CDC is saying so I, I wouldn't say that any one of them is wrong it's just um, just check both it's the same it's gonna be the same thing and but again I'm gonna say that keep in mind that every day even the CDC guidelines are changing so you need to be very attentive with that and just follow them regularly all right anything else All right, so I think we are done here. And if you have any questions, you can always leave um, your comments here. And I will try to get back to you as soon as I can. And along with that, uh, I'm going to send you the link that we missed because of the technical um, issues. You were not able to hear the audio. Um, I think you get the better idea now. Um, don't be scared just be thoughtful when you're treating a patient and keep yourself safe all right and of course special thanks to Hari Babu sir for giving me this opportunity and please stay safe and stay healthy all right okay have a good night because I think it's night there right so have a good night thank you everybody